welcome to episode 79 of Mighty Life Radio. Today I'm interviewing my friend Beverly Ramos. This is an interesting interview because a lot of the time people will be interviewed that have gone through their healing journey and come out the other side and they want to share exactly how they did it step by step and we talk about a lot of solutions in this episode but what's interesting is that Beverly is still healing from her iron overload and she did reverse her cancer which she talks about in the episode but now she's dealing with iron overload and a lot of the symptoms that come from that Uh, whole body itching uh, pain she mentioned especially in the knees Uh, a lot of chronic pain that people are dealing with is often caused by excess iron. It's a real issue that is overlooked. So this episode's full of a lot of solutions, um, largely for iron overload, but also uh, 5G or non-native EMF, Wi-Fi sensitivity, uh, which Beverly uh, is, is dealing with and getting out of environments, but also just mitigating and what she does for that, what's helped her for non-native electromagnetic field sensitivity. Uh, Beverly shares some really interesting uh, solutions that she's used, including uh, EMF blocking clothing, um, Blue Shield technology, which really helped her improve her health, um, something called Therify, Ophora water, and different things that I personally haven't tried. Uh, I have my own strategies for non-native EMF, and a lot of these uh, are similar to Beverly's. Uh, Dirty electricity Stetzer filters are amazing. I actually had an episode with uh, Dave Stetzer, the inventor of those filters that just plug into the wall. They're amazing if you stay at hotels, especially multiple stories up. I believe they're a lifesaver. And just having a little EMF kit with you, especially when you're traveling, is really important. I really prioritize it for my health along with water and air filtration, other things. I always have my pristine hydro travel system with me. I have my uh, hypoallergenic uh, air filters with me, the little small one. And of course, my red light therapy devices, usually a Gemba Red, uh, various little red lights that I'll put up. And just to make the environment a lot healthier, because there's so many aspects to Uh, Not even staying in hotels, but just being away from home when you don't have control over the environment. There's a lot of things you can do to set it up in a way to where it's way less draining. I mean, it's not going to be as regenerative as if you're home, most likely, unless you're way out of the city. (laughs) But if you're at a conference or you're traveling for work or whatever, most likely you're in the city and you need to mitigate a lot. And by mitigating a lot, you can make that trip or that experience of being away from home a lot less tiring and fatiguing on your body. And you'll have a better immune system, more energy, you know, more clarity. You'll be more in the present moment with your friends and loved ones and just have a better time overall. So that's the cool aspect of taking care of your health is that basically you just live a more full life. And I believe, especially if you have Jesus Christ in your life and the scriptures, which to me are the truth, then you have all the pieces to having a really fulfilling life. So we're going to jump into the interview. Here is Beverly Ramos. Enjoy. All right, we're here with Beverly Ramos. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Hi. <laughs> this is fun. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Um, we've been friends for a while, and you, you saw me go through all my different little experiments, and I think I watched you do that as well, just trying different protocols. And I think you went through the whole vegan-vegetarian thing long before I did, though. 
And, uh, yes, definitely, because I'm older than you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but yeah, I saw you on Instagram and was really struck by the heart that you had. You were really into the experiments you were doing, and it just felt like you were speaking your truth, and I appreciated that. Even if I didn't agree with something, I was so impressed that you seemed that you were speaking your truth. Simply that. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, just learning through through trial and error and failing, that's the best way to learn. <laughs> and uh, Definitely. Yeah, and something that I really love about you is that you don't hide the past and that people get to see your progression. I think that's extremely important. Instead of looking like 100% knowledgeable, there's such value in the transition. And I love that people can go back and see that you had a different belief and you changed. And you might change further in the future about something else. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. And having this podcast um, has really helped as well because um, I interview all these experts and I, I was really inspired by Justin of Extreme Health Radio. I really like Justin and Kate, what they're doing and Definitely. just kind of a similar, just keeping an open mind and interviewing, you know, you'll have a carnivore on the podcast. Then I had like a raw vegan on the podcast and just all these different. Yes, I've been both, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of done it all. And right now, what would you say you're you're doing just eating in a balanced way and kind of not restricting any macronutrients or food groups? And... Yeah, I definitely don't restrict any categories. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to avoid gluten when it's not properly prepared gluten. Mm -hmm. And I avoid dairy typically unless it's, you know, raw, pastured, really awesome dairy. I, I won't say no if it feels right in a moment. But for the most part, you know, I'll eat meat, I'll eat vegetables, I eat sugar, I eat grain, I eat a lot of different things. I, the difference right now is that I'm actually eating a lot of white potatoes and seafood, and I've never really been too excited about seafood, but right now I'm downing oysters when I can. That seems to be really key for me, and of course, having had high iron, which people listening may or may not know that I have had really high levels of iron in my body. The saturation level was crazy. So since I met you and found out that I actually do have high iron, um, I've had to adjust the way I look at my diet to some degree. And so, yeah, I was using a lot of liver for a while, hoping that bioavailable copper would help work with the iron. And I used to do raw liver smoothies years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was even before I knew about the iron. But it was kind of giving me life. And looking back, I know that that's really probably why. And people listening don't know that I've had cancer and I'm still here. And those liver smoothies were really key after cancer. And maybe I should go ahead and just share a little bit about that. Because yeah. in retrospect, looking back, it could be that having had high iron contributed to cancer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, please share... Um your whole journey with that and what, what kind of led, led to, to you getting that and the, um, mm -hmm. just your discoveries okay. and how you reversed it. Okay. Well, simply, I guess I'll preface it with for 20 years, I've been eating a nourishing traditions diet. I raised my kids on it, raw milk, pastured foods, just the best foods. And I started working in Dr. Town's office about 10 years ago in the city and I was there for about three and a half years and I started getting these weird symptoms and because I had such a good diet and lifestyle other than high stress, um, we actually didn't ever think that I had cancer. It never occurred to us and it turned out um, in an emergency moment, I had lost four liters of blood and you know, went to the hospital to find out why and it turned out I had cancer causing internal bleeding and of course, you know, having lost so much blood, I had a transfusion, and then they gave me iron pills to take. So, kind of funny that knowing now that high iron can give you a cancer metabolism, and it's possible that the symptoms I was having and the cancer could have been caused by it in the first place, and then I got a transfusion and high iron pills, it's kind of no wonder it was such a rough recovery. But that that's, that's kind of the foundation for this experience and 
the symptoms that I had then and now are whole body itching and pins and needles where I will get shocked and have pain shoot through my body. And, you know, the doctors thought this seemed like like a nerve cell that went haywire and a nonspecific neoplasm gastrointestinal tumor came through my stomach causing that internal bleeding and, you know, just about killed me. So I've actually had high iron. I've also had true anemia. And the contrast is great. <laughs> and I love knowing that, you know, iron dysregulation is really the, the thing that's going on for a lot of people. And they just don't know it. Mm-hmm. That, that if we knew that, we could really prevent and heal from a lot of disease. So, um, so yeah, so those symptoms continued even after the cancer was removed and mm. it's just been a huge struggle so so diet you know working with my diet has been an interesting thing because I've always done liver you know but I upped my liver and it gave me life and mm. then I went through a phase recently where I cut out liver for a whole month and that just about killed me actually that was not cool but we were trying to see if I had developed an actual reaction to organ and in that experience since I couldn't have liver or chose not to I ended up having some oysters that kind of brought me back to life so you know I have continued on that and Dr. Cowan he's one of the people that have really helped me through this and you too as well by the way I just I will certainly find a moment here to share how you saved my life (laughs) um so I'm currently on oysters and eating other kinds of seafood with lots of white potatoes and doing the root cause protocol as well, just Mm -hmm. actually minimizing the liver piece for now. So um, Mm -hmm. this is a trippy experience to be talking with you. (laughs) I'm I'm thinking you may have to edit this later big time. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. This is going to help so many people. And um, I wanted to ask, did you ever do like just, uh liver desiccated capsules instead of the whole thing like if you were traveling or you didn't have access to it because i know morley yeah. like recommends that for you know vegans that can't do liver for just they're grossed out or whatever um mm-hmm. but they're not yeah. they're not as good but there's still bioavailable copper in there right and... yeah i mean they're better than nothing but mm-hmm. there's certainly a difference Mm-hmm. having it fresh it's just so alive mm-hmm. and those raw liver smoothies that i used to do that's before i knew about the bioavailable copper i would add things to it like good fats and spices mm-hmm. to help protect from potential pathogens and mm-hmm. egg yolk and i just did so many um additions to it that it didn't quite taste like liver um that's really helpful for me actually to change the flavor and cayenne pepper was really key. I love cayenne pepper with liver because it's such a strong flavor, both of them. Um, but yeah, capsules, I've used them. I don't feel like they're as potent, but thank goodness they exist. I would encourage people to take them, definitely. That's interesting. I never thought about cayenne pepper or how that masks, that kind of like masks the flavor of the liver. Cause I, I cooked liver once and I think it's, it, it was, more gamey for me cooked than raw. It's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. It can be, but you know, the liver from different cows seems to taste different, just mm-hmm. like the meat from different cows from different regions tastes different. Mm-hmm. I've had some really gamey liver and I've had some really tasty liver. I used to just down it so regularly. I've had so many different kinds. Uh, gosh. <laughs> but yeah, um, cooking it can be tasty. Raw can be tasty. Capsules are tasteless. So whatever works for you to utilize that. But so the thing is, it's not just liver, right? You know, I actually will use chamomile tea and a lot of bee pollen and any foods that have copper. I kind of want to go towards that. And recently it was interesting because I don't really eat peanut butter. A lot of people don't eat peanut butter these days. But I've heard that peanut butter was one of the staple foods for a lot of people and they were getting copper from it and they didn't know it so some when i think about you know my partner who he he doesn't really eat liver but he'll eat peanut butter so it's like thank goodness (laughs) (laughs) that makes me feel better when i went through my vegan phase i think i did mostly almond butter but when i was 
you know, kind of getting by check to check, working multiple jobs. I think I was I was spending a lot of money just on two or three like jars of like organic almond butter. Some of them were like twenty bucks a jar. It was insane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. There was a time where there was a fire that burned a lot of the, you know, sources of almonds and prices skyrocketed. That was crazy. That might have been that time. Yeah. And why are you doing the white potatoes? I think you told me a little bit about that on the phone the other day, but was that something morally recommended or? No, actually, Dr. Cowan, he suggested that I do white potatoes. And Mm. that may come to us as a surprise to a lot of people that follow a nourishing traditions diet, Mm -hmm. but he definitely recommended them for me. And the thing I like about him is if something works great and if it doesn't, you know, he has no trouble in saying, let's try something else. And he already knows that I know the wise traditions, nourishing traditions thing. Mm -hmm. I've done that to perfection. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I haven't done. I've fermented everything. I've baked everything. I have made, you know, lacto-fermented beverages, you name it, I've done it, all the raw dairy stuff. I've got 20 plus years doing that. So we have to think a little differently for me. And part of that, I think, has, now that we know I have high iron, we've had to really think about that. And so, yeah, you know, he might not recommend white potatoes for somebody else, but he certainly does for me. And he's not afraid of sugar, by the way. I absolutely love that he has, in my opinion, a very balanced approach to food. He doesn't want us to skip out on any macronutrient. That's the whole thing with the Dr. Cowan's garden powders, too. The focus is not about micronutrients. You know, we don't even bother having, you know, the nutrition back for a reason. That's not the focus. So I just thought I'd mention that real quick. And people listening, um, I work for Dr. Cowan. I used to work in his medical office. I work for the family business selling and um i used to make the powders for dr cowan's garden a lot of love went in there by the way so now my job is otherwise because we've had to move production and find new things for me to do so i just thought i'd mention that real quick um yeah but what's what's coming up for me right now matt is i just really want to share how you've helped me oh (laughs) i would love to bring that into this conversation because, you know, everybody has things to offer and, you know, Dr. Cowan's one of the people that really helped me and you have as well. And I think if I hadn't met you and come to your first retreat, I don't know that I would be here right now. You know, Dr. Cowan helped me through cancer when he could still treat cancer. And I met you a few years after at your retreat, and I brought food with me, awesome garden produce, and I had my cast iron because I'm just so particular, right? And you're just like, I don't want to eat out of that. (laughs) And I'm like, what do you mean? This is my cast iron. It's great. (laughs) But, yeah, you really didn't want to eat out of it, and you did. You ended up kindly accepting the awesome food that I had, and so that was appreciated. But it was also such a great moment for me to really hear because you've met me where I was at. It was an opportunity for me to hear about the high iron. And you showed me a book on your shelf that you had. I think it might have been a book by Morley Robbins at the time. And that was my first introduction. And I, it took me time to process it, time to believe it. And then by the time I looked at my lab, because I was still in the recovery phase from cancer, I would have labs and checkups and things and the doctors there would look at the labs and say no you're fine but it was really that saturation piece you know looking at the percentage my iron saturation was 57 percent supposed to be 25 (laughs) no more than 35 so um really grateful that you keyed me in there and i could start to try things in a in a new way and you know that's just one significant moment with you I appreciate that. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, and uh, and I'm really glad I could help, and I'm really glad we're friends. And that was, that was, I think, when I was heading back to veganism, uh, largely for spiritual reasons. But I always had certain parts of the puzzle, like we all do, right? Uh, mm-hmm. No one has the whole the whole puzzle figured out. But yeah, over the years, I heard heard from just different uh, people in the alternative health space about iron overload and. Um, yeah, I mean, now there, there's great books on it now um, that I have on um, 
I mean, the diseases that are linked with it, people don't realize, like diabetes, heart mm-hmm. disease, Alzheimer's, um, yes. skin disorders, autoimmune yes. disorders. Uh, I mean, even anxiety, depression. Uh, it's really interesting. Like the book that I have even goes into like the hidden dangers of iron overload. I think is the name of it. it. Even goes into like the emotional stuff. And I like that Morley says it like yes. activates the fear center of the cell. It makes so much sense, right? That like, yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. Think of all these people during this uh, experience we're having right now, how the fear is rising in them. And I bet you their iron levels, levels are increasing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, or that's making them predisposed to, to having yeah. hysterical kind of outbursts and put on your mask. You know, I keep hearing these stories from my friends and they're like, I'm not putting on my mask. And I'm like, right on. That's awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, just yesterday, I I felt like I came up with a phrase that really works for me, that people are doing the best they can with the lives they've been given. Mm-hmm. Just And this is in general. You know, everybody's doing the best they can. And so when we know what better, we do better. And just, I really hoping for more compassion and love for all sides in this. You know, I definitely, I don't wear a mask unless I'm in a situation where I choose to be considerate of those who are scared. <laughs> and I want to be considerate for certain people, but this whole thing is just that right now. Yeah, right this morning before we jumped on, I, I listened to a Owen Benjamin clip where he was at the post office and some lady was like, you have to put on your mask. He's like, no, I don't. And she's like, oh, the governor said so. He's like, well, I'm not doing it. And she's like, well, I'm a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I know what I'm talking about. You know, get your mask. Yeah. And he's like, have you ever performed an abortion or circumcision? <laughs> just like, so. Oh, my like, goodness. <laughs> wow. She just didn't respond. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, it, it seems to be that, you know, there's this mandate, but... There's no enforcement of it. Mm-hmm. And I don't yet know anyone that's actually had to uh, go to jail or anything. I know that, you know, the public can be sort of unkind about it, but I don't know anyone that's actually gone to jail for it, you know? And I do, oh, get this, there's this restaurant where I'm at right now, and they actually have a sign that says that none of the staff will be wearing masks, and if you want to eat here, you have to accept that. And if you'd like to have food ordered from us and not come inside, we'll bring it to you, to your car or whatever. But I, I love that. I'm so excited. That's, I'm going to give them business just because of that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, up here in Idaho, it's pretty relaxed. But I know California is total police state. And Washington is very similar. I think Oregon, I mean, it's like all the same kind of mentality. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty intense here. You know, this is my home state. I was born and raised here, and I really have a lot of love for the place. And I'm finding myself alone right now, very alone in my beliefs. And it's sort of, it creates a bit of a divide. Unfortunately, that's not what I want. But, you know, that's why I'm up here visiting a friend in Etna, because at home I don't really have anyone to hang out with. They're all wearing the masks and don't want to be around me. (laughs) So I would Mm -hmm. if, if. I suppose if, I don't know, if and when. Anyway. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm the only person that moved out of state in my family. I mean, my parents moved from other states early on, but, like, I moved pretty early, and it's like, it feels weird to leave your home. You know, it's like leaving your childhood home. Like, it's like, there's like a sad kind of feeling to it, but um, I think there are a lot safer, better places to be than... uh, than where we grew up. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, you know, I went to Texas in December. I was willing to leave my family and friends mm-hmm. because I found a doctor that was actually willing to do phlebotomy for me every single week. And I was super excited about that and hopeful because, as you know, with high iron levels, you really have to donate blood mm-hmm. and or lose blood in some way. And being... 48 and having had cancer and just my body's a little bit older I think than my age I'm in menopause already and I haven't had a period so that that blood loss is so special for women and I know that a lot of women have struggles around it but it is such a blessing to shed blood and I don't have that so going to Texas having weekly phlebotomies was a really beautiful wonderful life-saving thing for me so you know, I did leave, and when I left, 
it was interesting to have an outside of state experience for a lot of different reasons, you know, because of the politics, especially, and also just to leave home. I never thought I could leave California, but that prepared me to be willing to leave. You know, I actually want to go homestead and get back to farming. I used to have goats and chickens and was out there on 100 acres, and we built a barn, and we just did so many wonderful things, and that's a passion. Like, I want to have food for my family and my community, and I think that's going to be essential in the future here, you know, have real Mm -hmm. food. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, the the tricky thing where I'm at right now is, like, I love carbs and sugar, but there's only, you know, in the winter, there's only milk and potatoes. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I, I kind of <laughs> like my fruit. And so that's like homesteading in the snow in like a northern latitude is so tricky. Like you have to, yeah. there's ways to do it. I think it just takes some more work. And I think that's why homes are generally cheaper as you go mm-hmm. north. <laughs> yeah. You know, I actually have been super stoked about something recently. I am excited to share it with you. So I don't watch much TV, but Jason and I, my partner, we thought, well, let's see if we could find something to watch. And so he found this program called Alone. So these people, they were dropped, 10 people were dropped in the Arctic. They're like survivalist type people. And we watched them survive in their environment, like find the food, create shelter, make fire and all that. And so there's this one moment where this guy He's out there, you know, and struggling with food. And he thought, if I could just get a moose. So he actually gets a moose. He takes it down. He's so thankful and and processing it. And he has lots of muscle meat. He has a gallon of fat. And he creates this structure to protect his food. And he's like, I've got this, no problem. This will last me all winter. So, you know, not too long after, a wolverine stole his fat. Or the fat that was in the container. So all he had was muscle meat. And he still thought, well, okay, that's a bummer. That's a lot of great nutrition, but, you know, I've got the muscle meat. In 30 days, the guy ate a lot of muscle meat. He lost a pound of fat, a a pound of body weight a day because all he had was protein. He didn't have carbs. He didn't have sugar. And it really drove home this point that you always talk about with protein and sugar, protein and sugar, because sugar, carbs will turn to what you need it to be. Mm -hmm. It can actually change. So this guy, he didn't have berries. He didn't have anything except muscle meat. You know, he's out there in the snow, in the Arctic, starving. Just fascinating. Really, really drove that home for me. So now I'm thinking like, you know, the the gummy bear thing with uh, (laughs) protein and sugar. (laughs) Not such a bad idea. (laughs) That's interesting. Yeah, I was just interviewed by two carnivore girls that are recently, recently started uh, introducing carbs and it was interesting because a lot of their listeners were wondering, what about the Inuit? You know, what about the Eskimos? What about the Inuit? And um, my friend Adam Bergstrom that I've had on the show and Ray Peets talked about the Inuit, um, where not only were they eating the thyroid gland, which can mitigate a lot of the damage of a low-carb diet, um, eating the thyroid itself, but they were eating mostly uh, deer, like ruminant animals. They weren't eating, you know all seafood diet like people think they were so it's it's really right. interesting all these misconceptions definitely yes <laughs> yes there's misconceptions about the meat they ate about the vegetables they ate people a lot of people don't realize like we didn't have broccoli or romaine lettuce in the past people were getting like 25 different types of vegetables you know <laughs> that's and, and eating yeah you know other types of meat so live and learn and just do our best and when you know better you do better I love it. Well, let's let's jump into the Q and A because uh, we have like a good maybe twenty twenty five questions or so. And uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> okay. I lumped them all all together. There were um, some different categories. We got soil, five G, but I want to start on iron overload since we already kind of talked a little bit about that. And um, I think I've, I've interviewed Morley like five times now, so there's a lot of info. But I think people could really benefit from hearing your experience with it. Um, because, uh, like our first question, how did you know you had iron overload? Because people think they don't have it, even though they're, you know, iron fortified foods they're raised with and drinking and bathing in iron. (laughs) Right. Well, see, that's the thing is I actually didn't know I had iron overload. I had no idea. And it wasn't until you told me about it 
that I started to look into it and thought, well, I'm still struggling. You know, I may not have cancer, but I have some health issues. I'm going to look into this. And I looked at the saturation level. That's really, you know, the fact that you wouldn't eat out of my cast iron was significant. Okay. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and I look at my iron levels and saturation level because it was so high, you know, I started to dive in and then the symptoms were there. And then I looked at my genetics and it turns out I have the hemochromatosis gene, I, you know, from both parents, not just one. And actually Morley Robin, you know, I've been working with him and he says that I'm the first person he's actually worked with that has the genetics from both parents. I am definitely predisposed. And of course, epigenetics, you know, genes don't have to be triggered, but mine were, and they were probably triggered in my youth. Like looking back, there are things that happened. Like I had whole body rashes, um, to a minor degree when I was young. And when I started my period, they went away. Hmm. I had beautiful skin, beautiful skin, beautiful hair. People would always comment on it. Like it was a little bit of an ego thing. And, um, I never, ever thought that had anything to do with my period and losing iron. But at this point, it's like, yeah, I think that's probably what happened. So, you know, it's in my family, the hemochromatosis thing, it's in my dad's family. And I didn't know. I just never knew. I'm grateful to know now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the symptoms that I have are what pain in the body. I think the pins and needles is probably part of that. Sometimes I feel like my muscle fibers are tearing. Like I have this, like, it feels like dry turkey ripping when I move. And I think that's partly a like cellular issue with mitochondria and water and all that. But the, the knees, pain in my knees, when the pain gets really intense in my knees, I know that I need to go have a blood draw. Every time my knees hurt like that, my hemoglobin's way up. And it's pretty easy for me to donate blood and then have a high hemoglobin not too long after. And I think that's because of utilizing all the bioavailable copper mm -hmm. and transitioning the, the labile iron that's stuck in the tissues. And of course, you know, the liver kind of gets targeted, I think, first. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it's emotions or what that, you know, causes like different parts of the body to be challenged by iron. But mm -hmm. my skin has definitely been the place, mm -hmm. you know, I seem to be, you know, I show the issues in my skin. So every time I donate blood, my skin feels better. I just feel better. It's, it's just such a trip. My yeah. coloring changes too. My skin tone changes. You know, they talk about that people that have high iron have funny skin tone. So kind of like pale, right? It, I mean, you can't get oxygen to the tissue. So just you lose like your glow kind of. Maybe that, yeah, grayish. Some people get grayish. Mm -hmm. Some people get reddish. Mm -hmm. And I tend to get more reddish. Mm -hmm. And when I donate blood, then I have this like real natural, beautiful porcelain kind of normal skin tone. That's what happens to me. And if only I could donate more. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because someone asked, what were the steps to recovery of iron overload and you're still working through it right it's a long it's a long process yes. it's not like a yes. few months or <laughs> yes in fact it's a very long process and when i met a doctor i was at the wise traditions conference and i was listening to ben edwards talk and he actually first of all he just really laid it clear for people simply if you eat a cup of cheerios what is that 17 milligrams of iron how many people eat one cup of Cheerios? And how many people in their whole lifetime have had Cheerios? Or any food that's iron-fortified, right? So I can look back and think, yeah, I've had iron-fortified foods in my youth. And and the thing is, if you don't have a menstrual cycle, if you don't have blood loss somehow, if you don't donate blood, you keep that iron in your body. So I think, first of all, having you know a way to lose iron is key got to have the blood draw you got to donate blood you got to have a period maybe have a baby <laughs> pregnancy helps with that um that's a big step and then trying to get the not just the right nutrition because i've had the right nutrition in my opinion for my body i've had such good food for 20 years best water best food and yet i needed the stuff more of the stuff that would transition and move the labile iron and another big key piece to this, so in recovery, is finding peace. So stress is a tough thing. And, 
you know, peace can come in many different ways. So for some people, it's finding God, really having that connection and being at peace like that. It may be working through emotions and past issues. So, you know, a lot of people need to do things like address the pain in their heart or the pain, you know, just wherever and work through it. And sometimes it's helpful to have a practitioner, I think, to get through that kind of stuff. Um, I've done some emotion code work and other types of work. So I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. How about you? What <laughs> else? What were you doing for recovery? <laughs> no, that's, that's good points. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Cause I feel like the emotional, um, like my, my worst skin in my life was when I was stressed out and you're just in a bad, bad relationship, bad living situation and the skin shows it. And so a lot of it, it's sometimes it's just switching up, not even food or water, you know, nutrition. Mm-hmm. It's actually just moving uh, to a different environment completely and getting out of a situation. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the emotional aspect. And um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm still working on iron overload. Uh, I was vaccinated as a kid and um, I think that played a role. But I also ate quite a lot of Cheerios, as he brought up, and mm, yeah. Lucky Charms, and uh, I love my my cereal, and I, I would say every day for years, and yeah, like definitely not a cup, probably three, four cups, maybe even more. I think I remember oh, yeah. having like two bowls sometimes, and so, I mean, we're really looking at like 70 milligrams plus of iron, right? Um, wow. So, and we're only supposed to get one. So, yeah, I think crazy. iron overload's a big deal, and it, it contributes to everything, so... I've been utilizing a lot of Shilajit, as you probably know, and I've been on that pretty much every day for years. And I think that's, it's not too well studied for its iron effects. I hope there's more research done on that. Uh, I guess big pharma can't really benefit, so I'm not holding my breath, but there's studies on how Shilajit helps anemia. A lot of people know about, you know, fulvic acid's effect on heavy metals, but it can also help to um, chelate uh, excess iron um so that's not like well established you know blanket statement in the in the literature but you can kind of read between the lines and see that's what it's doing um just that just the chemical structure of fulvic acid it makes sense but yeah really um vitamin c vitamin e mm-hmm. and shilajit um are my big kind of and, and copper of course from beef liver and yes. and uh yes and, and magnesium, C. of course, magnesium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. see, like C, C, E, copper, and magnesium are really important. And that's why I say almost everyone needs it, right? Because pretty much everyone's right. dealing with it. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, you know, I sometimes wonder if I'm dealing with, uh, how do you say it, lipofuscin? Lipofuscin. <laughs> uh, yeah. Lipofuscin. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if I'm dealing with that, even though what I've mostly had are saturated fat, mm-hmm. but, you know, how can that not happen when you have iron toxicity? And I don't know. I just feel like that that may be a thing. Yeah. Plus stress because stress um, raises estrogen, the stress hormone. And so Mm -hmm. it's really a combination of estrogen, iron, and then just a little bit of PUFAs. And I mean, we know there's omega threes in grass fed beef and in, you know, cold water salmon and people are doing cod liver oil and stuff. So that's, you have all the recipe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so we already answered that one. Someone asked, uh, what's the process for making Dr. Cowan's powders? It's a good question. Oh, gosh. Okay, the process, a very key part of it is finding awesome sources. People that are growing produce in the right way from nourished soil that's regenerated. And, you know, or finding things with a pristine environment like wild ramps. They won't grow unless it's a pristine environment. Like, that's an environment to mimic. You know, it's amazing. So, first of all, you got to have the best produce. And for the most part, Dr. Cowan's Garden has the best produce. If there's something like burdock, which is really uh, not a desirable thing to grow because it will take over and it has these horrible stickers, you know, most people don't grow that. So, it's not like we have a biodynamic source of burdock, but we do have... 
an organic source. So that's as good as it gets for that right now. Hopefully in the future there could be a biodynamic source, which biodynamic is really exciting, you know, kind of the best of the best. And I love that, I love telling people plants are not vegan. You know, they got to have the nutrients and they need blood, they need bone, they need everything. They're just waiting for us to compost, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, the full circle. So uh, biodynamic gardeners definitely take that into account. So sourcing, number one, and then to get down to the practical aspects, you have the vegetables, you wash them, and you you cook them and dehydrate them, grind them, sift it, put it in a jar. I used to make all the powders. So for like the first three years, a lot of those powders that people had, I made it. And for me, it's not like I love cutting leeks all day long or squash baking thousands of pounds of stuff, but... I love feeding people. I love nourishing people and knowing it was the best produce and putting my love into it was really key. So it's funny because if you go back to the beginning of my Instagram feed, back when I was making the powders, there are a lot of pictures of produce. And and one day I was just so full of gratitude and love that I carved the word love into the pumpkin that I was cooking and dehydrating and took a photo because it's like that's what's in here. You know, I think love is an ingredient in the food as well. Um, but yeah, anybody could do this in their home. They could just grow some vegetables, cook them, dehydrate them, grind them, put it in a jar. <laughs> That's super cool. Um, this is a good segue. Beginning soil 101, what would you use? Um, I, I've been learning a lot um, from from my girlfriend about this. Like uh, peat moss is a really good. And I mean, there. what I've learned, my understanding is like, there's only there's only so much you can do with store bought soil, which is usually what people go for, but that's not ideal, right? Like buying soil from a store. Like I checked, I think it was Home Depot. A lot of people will buy like soil from Home Depot or Walmart, and it's like all that's pretty toxic, right? <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. like yeah. I know like black gold peat moss is a pretty good starter, but then you want you know worms or worm castings, and then maybe compost or local mm -hmm. microbes and there's so yes. many things you could do yes. right definitely absolutely the life in the soil is what really makes a difference and having even fungi right that the, mm -hmm. i know that sometimes i've looked at the roots of things and seen some white stuff in the past and like what is that but that's actually a good thing you know so yeah yeah i i'm not the person to tell I, what i do is make really great compost mm -hmm. that's what i'm good at <laughs> I'm not the best gardener. I will say things turn very green and very get very big when I garden, but um, it's, I go by instinct, and I do put actually things like bones in my compost. I actually put blood in my compost. I don't waste anything from the food that I'm using. I put, oil, you know, the oyster shells. I use ash from the fire. I use everything, and I kind of just feel like, you know, it came from the earth, it's going to go back to the earth. And I know that some people are worried about meat or bones in a compost, but I feel like it works out for me. And the compost that I make is amazing for growing plants. So, you know, I can't give you like super specific things to go for. I would suggest that people get into biodynamics, look it up on the internet, you know, find out about the Demeter certification and, you know, maybe watch some of the videos of the farmers that Dr. Cowan's Garden has, you know, that might be a cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's but, you awesome. know, water is important too, yeah. actually. You know, that's another thing. Like, you and I, we both know about structured water and vortex water. And I would like to say, actually, that no matter what, whether it was cancer recovery or dealing with the high iron, or watering plants, the structured water thing has been key for me, and it makes a difference in everything. So it minimizes, helps minimize my symptoms. It helps hydrate me. I think it helps the plant flourish. Just want to put that out there. And that's something I learned from you. So that same yeah. trip where <laughs> I told you about the cast iron, you told you you had your vortexer yeah. with you, and I was like, "What's that?" And you're like, "You don't vortex your water." And I think I was familiar <laughs> with like spinning it because I was doing it with like a a wooden spoon and a pitcher for like 10 seconds. But the thing that you brought, you know, up to 27 minutes, it vortexes it in a really tight vortex that's pretty strong. And uh, 
I got that machine, the Duet Water Revitalizer, Tribest, Bed Bath and Beyond. Also, <laughs> it was just kind of weird, but yeah, yeah, it definitely felt the difference. And now I have it built in and custom. You can't buy it, but a little custom like water dispenser that vortexes it on a timer. But yeah, just for, like vortexing your water regularly it does definitely make a difference for sure. I oh, feel it. Yes. It really just changes it. It's life in the water. Stagnant water is is just it's just dead. It's simply mm-hmm. dead. That energy is key. Mm-hmm. And that was very fun for me, by the way, because you have contributed to me greatly. And just knowing that I did even one thing to help you, <laughs> I was like so excited about that. Yeah, it's it's cool having this community because we all learn from each other and bounce things off of each other, and it's really fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, that same weekend with the water vortexer and the cast iron, I had, like, gallons of milk and glass jars. Do you remember? I put those yeah. in your fridge. And I was, like, trying to get you to drink some raw milk. And you were going vegan. You were trying to do your, like, growing stuff in a fish tank. <laughs> so it was really funny because um, you weren't real into it, and I was just guzzling down this raw milk and... Um, happy to share if anybody wanted, but that was really fun to just see you get into raw milk so much and that you have goats. And by the way, people should know that goat milk has copper. That's another great thing about it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And and what's funny, I was in into it before, but um, I think I've said on previous shows, like my I had my spiritual kind of, you know, mm-hmm. path and that – I would say it's new age is what really led me to, um, to, to veganism. And that's why I think it, when you were coming over, I was delving again into that. And I went in waves like five times, um, just trying to yeah. become a God or to ascend or to gain magical powers. And, um, mm-hmm. I tried that. I'm pretty open about that, that I'd used to do that. I don't do that anymore. I'm Christian yeah. now, but yeah, I think just understanding that life eats life and, and uh, just respecting yes. there's a system here. And it's, yes. I, I just, I don't see a lot of Christian vegans. I know one, my friend, Raw Matz is an ordained minister, MMA fighter, <laughs> very intelligent. He can debate mm-hmm. the most scientifically knowledgeable mm-hmm. atheist and just destroy him. Um, <laughs> so that's great. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that it's really important for people to follow their beliefs mm-hmm. and you know, that may get into some weird situations for some people, but with respect to food, if you believe you should eat vegan, you probably should. And I'm not saying for health, but, you know, there's probably some lesson in it. Or if you're believing you should eat meat, you probably should. And the, partly why I say that is because, you know, I went through a raw vegan stage, and it was felt like sort of the cleanest I've ever been, but then I got, like, lightheaded and passed out and... And it, I ended up with tooth decay and, you know, the raw vegan stage, I took it too far. It was pretty harsh. I never changed my family's diet. I was still making spaghetti and meatballs for them and I would handle raw meat. And one day I was like, oh my goodness, this meat looks so good. I want to eat it like raw. I was like, what's wrong with me? It was against my beliefs. You know, I didn't want to kill anything. And then of course there's the whole thing where I ended up feeling like, like vegetables and trees and it was a progression, but I felt like they're a living thing, too. Where do you draw the line? But um, I, I think it's important to follow your beliefs, and that's a kind of love for yourself and for respecting everything out there. So I don't want to get too into that, but, um, you know, there's something to gain from experiencing it all, and I just felt like I had to eat meat. And once I passed out, I was, like, at the hospital, and they're like, you need protein. (laughs) And so I ate some protein, cheese and crackers in the moment, and I perked up, of course. And I started to listen to that craving, and I just started searching for raw meat, right? Who in the world eats raw meat because I'm craving it so hard? And that's actually what led me to raw milk, by the way. Well, actually, I I take that back. Raw's first raw milk introduction was being a mother that was pregnant and breastfeeding my children. I know that gets weird, but breast milk is raw, right? (laughs) So first of all, I'm giving my children raw milk the best. And then, you know, going through my raw vegan stage, um, I was afraid of raw meat. And my first jump into raw milk was that raw cheese from the grocery store that I could find and... And then I got into raw milk, and of course I found people eventually that did like 
they would eat like kibba and carpaccio and certain raw meat dishes. And I just transitioned real quick into that and eventually went to the point where if I'm going to eat meat, I had to be willing to kill it. So that's kind of another thing that took me to the country and, you know, my family and I moved and we built a barn and I had goats and chickens and if I was going to eat meat, I was going to have to kill it. So, so I did. I, I processed one of my goats and it was one of the most significant um, experiences of my life. It was also one of the most painful and the most pure cry I've ever had because, you know, a lot of times we feel uncomfortable crying in society and of course I was on my own property, but I cried for like 45 minutes from this moment of processing this goat and it was just so incredible and pure and following my beliefs and at that point, I also decided that I don't have to be the one to process them. Let, let someone else be the processor. I'd rather be a nurturer. Mm-hmm. But the point of this is when I would hear you talk about not killing animals and, you know, wanting to find a way to make it doable to be mm-hmm. without it, I was like right there with you while I was eating meat, while I was having bone broth. And mm-hmm. yet I wanted so wholeheartedly to like not need these things mm-hmm. because I didn't want to kill. And I just, at this point, I just, I really... I really respect the life that mm-hmm. is provided for us in an animal. The food, the nourishment is just so profound, and we're meant to take part in it all. Mm-hmm. I believe. I know. I know that you know there are other beliefs, and I've been there, but mm-hmm. the full circle thing has happened for me. That's that's so awesome. Yeah, and I, especially in the context of today's world, where we have an insane amount of stressors and just pollution and. People don't realize like amino acids themselves can be medicinal. It's not just for muscle. It's so many things. I mean, uh, yeah. it's an a, it's a it's an acid buffering system uh, along with the bicarbonate buffering system. Um, there, there's that amino acid buffering system. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so many things. And I think, I mean, I think prior to the flood, there used to be you know fruit everywhere, and we probably fruitarian or probably could have worked, but we're in a different time now. And so, yeah, maybe at some point, I don't know when Jesus returns or something, it might be different. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I kind of want to go into 5g because this is a a Uh, fascination of yours and, and you have a lot of experience with it. And um, (laughs) I've, I've studied because I used to be in the whole quantum health thing and, you know, there's this kind of cult of like, Heavy seafood diet, megadose DHA, sun gazing, uh, unlimited sunbathing, uh, and usually spring water, and then basically mm-hmm. circadian rhythm stuff. And there's you know always truth with lies and different movements, and so there's some good stuff there. Um, mm-hmm. But you definitely don't want to mix uh, omega threes with all UV light because you get a uh, pretty extreme mm-hmm. lipofuscin. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the five G thing is interesting because everyone has their own little solution to it, and yeah. I mean, it ranges from like little scalar stickers. Uh, I mean, right. some people just do affirmations. This cannot harm me, which I don't believe works. <laughs> and then, like, and you have people doing practical stuff, like maybe magnesium bicarbonate, or there's the blue shield, or um, you even yeah. have like shielding clothing that you wear, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, simply over time. I have learned that I'm super sensitive to Wi-Fi and cellular and 5G, and I didn't want to believe it because, you know, that means I have to get away. And, you know, um, over a year and a half ago, my partner bought me a sweatshirt that would block the EMFs, and I would put it on, and actually it felt like a little cozy cave. It feels really good to wear it. Like, I could actually tell the difference. And the thing is when, so first of all, we know that I'm still struggling. I am not out of the woods. And I think there's a lot of value in that. Most people that I feel like get on a podcast, they've already, you know, healed from everything and know all the answers. And I don't have all the answers and I'm still struggling and I'm very sensitive. So when I find something that works, then I know it works. There's no question in my mind. So that sweatshirt was super cozy and comfortable and helped me. And, you know, then we had gone to another level and we changed out the smart meter on our home. And, of course, we would turn off the Wi-Fi at night. And, you know, there's all these steps. And I was also working with lowering iron. It's something people might not realize is when you have high iron, especially a high saturation, you become like an antenna. 
And so that might explain why I'm so sensitive and maybe other people aren't. And so, you know, I've done my best to mitigate. You know, I do things like I use a keyboard that has a cord and I use a mouse that has a cord and I use an Ethernet cable with my computer. I do these things, all these mitigations, and, you know, I try to get away from it as much as I can. But here I am in Northern California where there's almost no Wi-Fi and cellular. It's very minimal, and I really feel different. You know, whether I was in California, in the Bay Area, whether I was in Texas, whether I was in Illinois, you know, I feel it. I feel it. And here I am in a quiet environment. Like, I'm lucky to be able to communicate with you right now because there's enough Wi-Fi that I can. But I also brought my blue shield. So um, there are other things I've done. Like, there was a time where I was believing that molecular hydrogen would help me deal with Wi-Fi, and I was using that. And... You know, magnesium, because of that calcium channel thing, I would, you you could probably talk about that, but that's the thing that I, you know, like magnesium for to really help. And even though I have all these fabulous things, um, I have still been really challenged. And the most recent one that I would love people to know about is that I got to the point where my body wasn't healing. Like my knuckles were all cracked. Every joint was painful. And it wasn't injury, but I wasn't creating, I guess, enough energy cellularly to repair my body. And I felt death. It was the most awful experience to not have energy to do anything and to not have energy to heal. And I'm so young and it just doesn't make sense, right? But it really became clear that something was getting me. And uh, it happened to some say something to you and I'm not sure what you heard but you sent me a blue shield so just give me a second here because you that's another moment of you saving my life (laughs) I was at my mom's house for about a month I didn't want her to be alone during this whole shutdown thing and shelter in place so I went to my mom's to stay with her and a year ago, they had put in a tower across the street from her home, and they had recently lit it up. So I'm sure that that tower was affecting me, and I don't know what I had said to you or texted you, and you sent me a blue shield, and we plugged it in, and the next morning, my symptoms were so much better. I was so much better that there's no denying it, that the blue shield did something, and so that's been such a blessing, and... Since then, I've upgraded because where I live in the Bay Area of California, we have four or 5G towers that are lit up, and it's harsh, and I felt it. Basically, when they turned the first one on, I didn't know it, but I started oozing out my skin, and I happened to get the, the big blue shield right about that time. I was so lucky to get it because it was crazy to have that experience, and recently, when they turned on the next three, I felt it. I called, you know, I called the phone company and I'm like, what's going on? Did you guys turn on a tower? They're like, yes, we did. We did it ahead of schedule too. Isn't that great? So um, I know that these things help and it's also not, for me, I need to get away from it. Mm-hmm. So at this point, I do intend to move. And but yeah, thank you for sending me the Blue Shield. Thank you for hearing. And a lot of people have bought Blue Shield since then, by the way, because they know me and they know how much it helped me. <laughs> so um, huge blessing. And what else? What else? Um, Vortex water. (laughs) Yeah, the 5G is an issue. It really is. And I would love to take this moment really quick to say that um, there are all kinds of toxins, right? We have pollution. Mm -hmm. We have food that's tainted. We have stress and 5G and cellular and Wi-Fi. And it does affect people. No matter how much people deny it, you know, you may be getting by, but it does affect you. And I think that it's the buildup of all these toxins that it's just so layered that, you know, it makes people unwell and adding 5G on top is going to really cause problems. It's a microwave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I know like Martin Paul, I haven't watched all of his videos on YouTube, but he has a lot of great material on non-native EMFs and, by the way, I'm happy I, I could help. Um, there's, I like the way that you articulated all of that because it's not just the blue shield. There's so many factors, right? And 
it's amazing to me, like people in the city are still alive and functioning. I mean, that shows the resiliency of the body. I mean, I don't know if we're yes. going to have a mass, you know, die off at some point, but like someone asked in the Q and a, will there come a time when our bodies will adapt to the 5g radiation? And I think we'll, people will die before they adapt. I mean, right. Cause our body can't mm-hmm. adapt that quickly to yeah. something this different. Yeah. I mean, if you put food in the microwave, you see what happens to it. Like that's what's happening to us, you know, right. that's what's happening. And so honestly, I don't know that we could adapt to it. I know that our bodies work very, very hard for us. And, you know, it's great to just say thank you to our bodies for doing the very best they can with what they're given mm-hmm. and have a ton of gratitude. And, um, you know, gratitude, by the way, I, I got to throw this in here. Gratitude is so key. Like mm-hmm. to feel gratitude is different than to be grateful. Like, I live on gratitude, but to feel it, you get that light up in your body, and it's just a really important thing, and I don't know that it can, you know, we can be so grateful that we could protect against 5G, I don't know, but um, I happened to come to Northern California in a car that is a hybrid, I didn't know it, (laughs) and I was in a lot of pain in the car, and now... um, now that I have that awareness, I'm going to just like really just be grateful as grateful as I can that it's getting me from A to B, but um, definitely don't want to be in one of those cars with the batteries again. Um, yeah, now um, you have all the people with Teslas and all the electric cars, which is just insane because that's that's just adding to the problem for even other people, right? <laughs> yeah. You know what, though? I got to, since you mentioned, mentioned Tesla, yeah. there's something, um, I, don't, I don't know about the cars, but... There's a tool that I've been using. One of the new things is called Verify. Oh, yeah, you're saying. E-R-A-P-H-I. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, they actually use a real Tesla coil. And so I have been doing this treatment, this session, where you just lay on a massage table. The Tesla coil is underneath. Mm-hmm. And on the ends, by your feet and your head, are these bolts. And it creates this field. And it is the most warm, soothing, structuring, cell-structuring field I've ever been in. It feels so good. And I can actually feel the sensation when I'm in it, mm-hmm. and it's been giving me a lot of energy. And I think that it might even be key in helping people deal with 5G. Ideally, mm-hmm. we would get rid of 5G. You know, nobody needs faster than 4G. Nobody needs 5G. Nobody. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because here that like I need to use all these Jetpack Verizon boosters to have any cell, mm-hmm. any reception, any internet connection. Um, unfortunately, but I mean, there is ethernet, but it's just snail speed. Like I couldn't do the podcast on that. And so I think for people on the outskirts, like 5g might reach them and it might, you know, like I could actually work efficiently from home, and, but do the benefits outweigh? I mean, everyone is getting nuked in the city where the towers are. So that's not yeah, ideal, yeah, but yeah. that's interesting. You brought up Therify. I haven't looked into it yet. Um, I know there's one that's really popular in the biohacking space. Uh, what is it? Oh, the human, is it the human charger? I think it's like the halogen gas and it makes a really obnoxious loud sound. It's like, and it's like plasma, like noble gases. I don't gases. even know that one. I don't even know that at all. It's I just, probably like, the similar. The human charger I know is the one that you use to promote with it that goes into the ears with the oh, light. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that thing, by the way, actually. I do have one. I love it. Oh yeah, I used it right before the podcast. It's good on like overcast days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And you're and so while we're on technologies, you were also saying before we started recording the the water was it orfo orfora ophora water or something was helping you? Oh, the ophora water is amazing for me, mm-hmm. and you know I'm all about structured water, but mm-hmm. because I have high iron, I've been a little fearful of anything that talks about oxygen because yeah. oxygen you know creates rust with iron. It's something I want to avoid. Oxidative stress is something I have plenty of. I don't want more. And so just the idea of like an oxygenated water, I was feeling a little stressed about trying, but it actually has given me great energy and it has also helped my digestion. And I, you know, I love my Live Pristine water filter so much. And I love the water filter I had before. And, you know, I love the Vortexer and making my carbonates. That's another great thing to do. But, um, there's something about the Ophara water that I feel I really need right now. Mm-hmm. Crazy expensive, but it's like a medicine for me. And, awesome. you know, I don't know if there's a way to take the Live Pristine water and create it into that type of water, but um, I'm certainly going to continue using my Live Pristine filter. I love it so much. 
Absolutely. That, and then I've got supplemental Ophora water. That's cool. Yeah, I recently interviewed Dr. Cass Ingram again for the third time, and he was saying the wild P73 oregano, a lot of its benefits come from the oxygen in it, especially the juice of oregano, like the essence. There's like um, stabilized yeah, right. oxygen in the oregano, especially if it's processed correctly. Um, uh-huh. So that's like part of its I benefits. love the, that, that oregano oil, mm-hmm. and I have actually used it. Um, I used to do a lot of uh, gua sha and sauna, mm-hmm. and I would put that in my fat that I would put on my skin. In fact, mm-hmm. this is kind of fun. You know, people oil pull for doing the their mouth, right? Cleaning their mouth in the morning, they'll mm-hmm. oil pull before brushing. And what I like to think of the, the skin thing as is um, oil pulling for the skin. So if I go in a sauna and I'll put oil on and then I'll scrape it off, it's pulling stuff out of my skin, I think, that's beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. And But I would put the wild oregano in that oil. I like to put it mm-hmm. in there. And if I'm not broken out in a rash from a flare-up, it's really great for my skin, and I love using it on spots, you know, but if I have a rash, of course, it's too harsh to do that with, but I love the wild oregano from Cat Ingram. That's really good. That's cool. I, I put it on the bottom of my feet in the sauna, and that's a pretty intense experience. I don't know mm-hmm. if it's, it's probably individual with how you feel, but it's it burns pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Um, actually, the other day I had put a little bit on my neck, and I had to go wash it off. <laughs> it was too too intense. Yeah, it's, so this is a good question. I ditched my prenatal because of iron, but I'm worried about folate. I don't know what the obsession with folate is, um, but I've seen it in the alternative health community. I mean, that's in a lot. Like it's in eggs, right? I don't know, you can get in pastured eggs. Actually. Um... I suppose so. Like, you know more on that than I do. Um, I definitely think it's a very smart move to get rid of commercial prenatal vitamins. They're toxic, in my opinion. And taking any iron supplement is pretty much toxic. I would think that just sticking to liver, uh, the copper, having, uh, I mean, the the, um, bee pollen and whole food vitamin C, anything that can provide bioavailable copper and, and eat that with your liver and other, you know, foods that have um, copper and iron, let's see, what would that be for a pregnant one? Well, you know, Melissa Hennig, she's awesome, and she has some great suggestions, Um, but I think a nourishing traditions diet is a very wise thing for a woman to follow when she's pregnant, and, you know, the eggs are a great thing, for Mm -hmm. sure, grass-fed beef, oysters, I don't know. I love it. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of fear with pregnant women, like I've spoken with a few, um, and there's just... I don't know if their their doctor or whatever just incites like if you don't take a multi-mineral or multivitamin or prenatal, you know, you're screwed, mm-hmm. you know, or <laughs> something. I don't know. It just seems like that's the mindset. But it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, Melissa didn't take any supplements and her kids are so bright and energized and yeah. healthy. I mean, so. most vitamins like that end up in your pee anyway. It's not, it's a waste of money. It's not actually nourishing you. It's not a form that's absorbable by the body mm-hmm. and it can be toxic. And so just stick to whole foods, real foods, Mm -hmm. definitely. And something interesting that, you know, I think is important for people to know, you know, there was this study done with healthy women and healthy babies. You know, they they went to the end of their pregnancy and were testing their iron. And women actually naturally, their iron levels will lower when they're pregnant at the end of pregnancy. And the reason I found out about this is because a good friend of mine in Texas As she was getting towards the end of her pregnancy, and she follows the root cause protocol, by the way, um, at the end of her pregnancy, her iron levels were going lower. And the doula said, you know, I'm not going to work with you. I can't work with you. I'm not allowed to work with you if your iron hemoglobin levels go under 10, something like that. And, you know, she ended up getting connected with Morley because I'm connected with Morley. And he actually has access to these studies that show it naturally lowers. So it's kind of evil that in the system, they're actually trying to raise women's iron at the end of pregnancy. And I know I will get hell for saying this, but if you look at those studies, there's proof that a healthy woman, a healthy baby, the healthiest of them all, actually have lower iron levels. You don't need to be raising it. That makes sense. It's more about iron regulation, right? We need bioavailable mm-hmm. copper. We need to get regulated. Yeah, and retinol, which helps to... Um, uh, 
make ceruloplasmin. So it's like that. And liver is perfect, right? Because it has the retinol, vitamin A with the yeah. copper. And so it's kind of like the retinol plus copper creates health. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I mean, yeah. animal foods. Yeah. And... <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Have you seen the iron fish? Like I used to get ads for that where it was like you boil this fish that's made of iron. It was like a little supplement they would sell. Mm. And it was just so evil. Yeah, they're like, you know, basically boil this fish, the iron goes in the water, and you drink the water. I'm like, this is just demonic. <laughs> That's insane. Well, actually, you know, talk about social programming. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I was listening to public radio one night, and I I definitely can hear the programming now. And this one topic, it was this show that I used to love, this woman started talking about a, a bean with higher iron, and that they were going to uh, have this propagated in Africa. And I just was stunned that this was a celebration about this higher iron bean. And I just thought, I don't think that's such a good thing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, Adam Bergstrom was saying that they're trying to create, a bunch of companies are trying to create a PUFA-free soybean. So they're actually bringing wow. the unsaturated fats. They're trying to bring it to zero. Um I think because they'll go less rancid or they can last longer. You know, it's for nefarious purposes. It's not for health. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was kind of funny. They're like trying to genetically modify the soybean to have no polyunsaturated fats. Wow, that's, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that would work. Uh, um, this is kind of a random question. Gallstones or gallbladder pain? Have you ever looked into that or did you ever experience that? Well, um, I have actually, I've benefited from a gallbladder cleanse. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had some symptoms in the past that um, supposedly were gallbladder, and so I did a cleanse. But I, I never had known stones or anything. Um, but it, it, it was kind of one of the best times I felt when I went on a gallbladder cleanse. Was what it was like the question exactly? <laughs> Just your tips or insight on if someone has gallstones. What did you like? Was it like grapefruit juice and like magnesium sulfate? I think that's like the normal thing. No, no, no. Um, uh, let's skip that because I would have to recall the whole protocol. Um, it was, you know, like a package of supplements, of oh, okay. herbs and things. Mm. And, you know, I did feel pretty good while I was doing it. Oh, get this though. I got to share this. Um, you know how there are people that are thinking we evolved with parasites and people they're like oh parasites are awful and I know you've been through a progression mm -hmm. when I first started following you you were like trying to catch them <laughs> and it was fascinating right and I've recently kind of really understood more so how they're a benefit to people perhaps so if I have high iron and there happens to be a lot of iron in my liver or gallbladder or something well that's a perfect place for parasites to be like I don't have any proof of parasites and you know I've done some things like oh wouldn't it be cool if that could be a, a notice thing so I would know what to deal with but actually if I have high iron parasites might be there to be helping me not intentionally like that's their food right they love iron and it's kind of like how when you have an overgrowth of anything those organisms are just doing their job they're great at doing their job it's that the environment is out of balance so having iron out of balance could potentially bring pathogens to your liver and to your gallbladder i'm not sure that it's the worst thing on the planet I, this is not medical advice this is just like a thought process i'm going through because you know what if they are helping what if they if anyone that has them maybe they have a purpose and so the goal is to get in balance and i like to think about balance like Harsh symptoms are a body's attempt at balance, right? We always talk about, oh, get in balance, but that crazy out-of-balance experience is like the opposite to the other opposite, you know? And so what I would like is to find a peaceful balance with things, and I love being in balance. It feels really good, you know? So I, I hope that makes sense. Maybe, maybe if it does make sense to you, you can articulate it, but... <laughs> It does, yeah, because I feel like people go pretty hard on the parasite cleanses. And I actually just got from um, Shen Blossom, he created a few 
new, um, like a five resin product, which is kind of fun. It kind of tastes similar to turpentine. There's no turpentine in it. And then like a mountain detox, which is just a ton of stuff, aged garlic and clove and mimosa bark and all pumpkin seed and skin, all sorts of stuff. But, um, yeah, I think if, you know, you take care of a lot of the issues and iron overload, then you can maybe do a little parasite cleanse with good products. Not like I'm not, a, I'm not for like diatomaceous earth anymore. I think that's a little harsh and I think people get a little crazy, I think with the cleansing and you can do damage with cleansing, right? And detoxing sure. too hard. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, it really comes down to being able to detox. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not even sure about the immune system anymore. If that's a thing, <laughs> like I've heard enough now that I really wonder about it, but detoxing is so important and anything that's going to help us detox safely. You know, when you detox too much, it can be stress on the body. So, you know, doing it in balance gently is a good idea. What do you mean the immune system isn't a thing? Like, um, like it doesn't, like you've heard, like it might not exist or. (laughs) Well, yeah. So you know how everybody's talking about the coronavirus right Mm -hmm. now and the way I'm starting, you know, or been understanding things is that like the test that they have Mm -hmm. is actually testing for exosomes, which is sort of like the result of a toxin in the way I think about it. And, you know, when people get chicken pox, we used to celebrate it and go get chicken pox. And we would share this information from one body to another. And I think that there's this, um, it's not that like a virus is a problem. A virus is just information and it's something we share with other people and that it's like a benefit to be in community. And so right now I'm totally against this isolation thing and against wearing the mask because that particle, it doesn't even matter. But um, I think that the immune system is, is, I think that in the future we're going to hear it talked about differently. Mm-hmm. And, and it's going to become more about the body's ability to detox. And mm-hmm. but that's, that's just, I can't go into detail. I'm in the process of discovering and understanding. So um, I just know that, you know, the coronavirus has been around forever. Chickenpox has been around forever. And, you know, people get these things and they work through it. And if a person is super toxic, they may have an extreme challenge recovering. And if they're less toxic, it'll be easier. And, so I think that detox piece is really key, minimizing, you know, pollution, like where you live, minimizing the toxins in your food and in your water. Water filters seem to be essential, you know, but they are. And having clean food and doing your best and, and you know, what you think about and just having less stress and just being as clean as possible. And obviously the liver gets packed with, you know, stuff from PUFAs, and so, you know, minimizing that, you don't need any supplemental PUFA, just Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to support the detox of the body, I think is maybe going to be far more important, and getting exposed to things is far more important, and I know that I'm going to receive so much flack for that, I already have, I've lost a lot of friends, (laughs) it's a bummer. That makes total sense, yeah, I mean, it it seems like there are widespread toxicities and uh, deficiencies. I mean, aluminum and uh, melted cheese, uh, everyone has aluminum poisoning and I mean, it's everywhere. Um, yeah. I mean, there, and then widespread copper, magnesium, uh, retinol, even E and K2 deficiencies. Yeah, it's just- Yeah, it, you know, <laughs> even white food, like uh, there's a, I'm not gonna say brands, but there's like, <laughs> sour cream on the market where they put titanium dioxide, I think it's called, to whiten it. Like there are things they put in food that they don't have to tell us. So it's like, just go organic if you can. Do your best. You know, do your best. When you can do better, you do better. But like, they put things in food that are toxic. And uh, metal is definitely one of them. And so I was thinking about this recently that I think 5G is kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. I think it's kind of like that extra spark that lights the fire of health issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, that's why as there's a rollout of 5G, we're going to see more illness with respect to the coronavirus, which is not even 
this is not even true. You know, that test is completely false. It's, the test, everybody has exosomes, everything. It doesn't matter if you're stressed. It doesn't matter if you have a cold. It doesn't matter if you have pneumonia. No matter what illness you have, you're pretty much going to test for exosomes, which is why, like, these nurses that send in, uh, you know, fruit or, you know, something from their dog or that guy in that other country that, that sent in things, they got back results saying that they had the coronavirus. It's BS. It's complete BS. Um, so, gosh, that's that's just you know such a such a fiery topic right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I love what you said about that. That's why I had Georgie Dinkoff on again to talk about the liver, and he said you know two thirds of American have liver Americans have liver damage, and one third are pre diabetic. And I mean, I've been researching endotoxin, and you were talking about yeah. exosomes. I mean, endotoxin is this, the shedding of the gram negative bacteria. Um, and when that goes in the bloodstream, it can kill someone. It's lethal. But the first line of defense to endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide is the liver and the, wow. the cupra cells in the liver. And so okay. we know those are already hammered with iron with most people. And so yeah. I'm just starting to like see the connections. And I mean, not to mention endotoxin increases lipid peroxidation by 23 times uh, or the oxidation of iron, excuse me. Wow. Um, but that's kind well, of how do you think that affects hormones for women when they have like high estrogen and, and hormonal issues that must be connected somehow? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's like kind of like a positive feedback mechanism. And so it kind of each each part of the wheel kind of keeps perpetuating it to keep it going um, with estrogen and then increased serotonin and then <laughs> the poofas and the iron. And it's really it's really a nefarious uh, kind of cycle. But um, yeah, I think we gave a lot of solutions here that are good, and and, and um, I think that'll help people just hearing your experience and what you've used to help. And um, there's just so many so many things we have available to us. And I I I started this podcast largely because I just listen to other podcasts and they're recommending you know machines for ten thousand dollars and just structured water breathing devices and just like these really expensive biohacking tools and like that people that are restricting sugar and it's just like, why don't we just like yeah. <laughs> start with the foundation yeah. stuff and then build from there and lower stress. And... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think sugar is great. <laughs> I love it. I especially love maple syrup. That's mm -hmm. my number one. And then raw honey. Yeah. Okay. Another number one. Yeah. And then sugar. I think it's great. Of course, you know, having minerals is really important. People need minerals. And so like in the Western A price organization, there's a lot of focus on sugars that have the minerals with them. And I think that's why, you know, the, the maple syrup is so great because the roots are growing down deep and there's a lot of minerals in the maple syrup still. But um, other kinds of sugar are fabulous too. And it's just, we got to get our nutrition otherwise. Got to get the minerals, got to get the protein, got to get the fat, you know, balance it out. That's an Definitely. awesome point you made up because sugar like especially cane sugar or sucrose gets so demonized because minerals, but mm -hmm. are we talking about inorganic minerals or carbon bonded minerals? And like a lot of these people that are saying sugar is evil that don't even know shilajit is mm -hmm. kind of the answer to mineral depletion and, mm -hmm. and mineral imbalance. Um, that it just blows my mind. Like I don't want minerals with my sugar because I get them elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we know you love maple syrup, though. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm drinking that in my coffee right now. And it's, yeah, I was just listening to a new Ray P interview uh, yesterday, and it was funny. He was talking about coffee and caffeine because someone asked, uh, you know, what about the addictive nature of caffeine and coffee? Is that a bad thing? And he was saying he was drinking up to, f I think, 50 cups a day of coffee um, to feel normal. And because that it was uh, bringing him up to normal because it was acting like a thyroid replacement before he found wow. a thyroid medication. <laughs> and so That's it kind of acts, acts like thyroid and progesterone. But he was saying he did a, tons of cream with it. And so that heavy mm -hmm. cream like balances out the caffeine, slows its absorption. And just that mm -hmm. all that fat really, and always after food, he emphasized that. So it's, yeah, there's so many pieces of the puzzle. But I mean, coffee inhibits iron absorption, right? So it's, it's a right. really great tool. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's really an important thing for me. And I really appreciated that you have talked a lot about coffee, a lot about tobacco, 
and um, the, the coffee, of course, helps inhibit iron absorption. So that's something I've done. And then milk does that as well. And I love that you have helped me see that tobacco is not a bad thing because it's kind of important. They call it the king of herbs. Right, the Native Americans really appreciate it, and I was raised to not smoke, not drink, you know, no caffeine. Um, I was kind of raised a little house on the prairie. My parents, by the way, met at Bible college, <laughs> so you can imagine. And uh, a lot of my family loves little house on the prairie, as do I. But uh, I was raised without these things and to demonize them. And I have learned that um, tobacco can be an amazing thing. You know, I'm not suggesting cigarettes for anybody. I do appreciate the plant, and about six years ago or so, I started growing tobacco. I had bought the plants at the Women's Herbal Symposium, and I, at first I thought I was buying them for my partner to get in touch with the plant because he actually does smoke cigarettes, and it, that's kind of a miracle in itself. You know, everybody that knows me was shocked that I would dare, you know, be with anybody that would smoke, and I'm so glad that my heart and, you know, didn't stop me from, you know, mm. valuing a person that smoked. I, I still, I'm not supporting cigarettes, <laughs> but those plants have been such amazing medicine and to watch you use tobacco and to see you make the anvil and to learn from Native Americans directly mm. how valuable it is. That, like when they smoke, you know, they're bringing prayer into it. And I know that that may not fit with, you know, the things you believe these days, but I really appreciated it in the moment when I was with them. And loved that they actually inhale. They didn't inhale. They took the smoke into their mouth and then they blew it out. And it was just, it was just really a sweet thing. And I've seen a lot of good medicine in a sense come from tobacco. I appreciate you not demonizing it, helping people realize it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's how it's used. And you know, something like alcohol. I was raised to think it was a bad thing, and I, for the longest time, couldn't really appreciate it. And then when I started working with an herbalist, you know, she's one of the well-known herbalists in our area. And, you know, alcohol is used to extract the spirit from a plant. And I know that if we drink it ourselves, it sort of does that to us too. And that's not a good thing. But I do see alcohol being used, extracting the spirit of a plant in a sense and putting its value in the tincture. And it can be great medicine. So I, I shifted in the way I thought about alcohol. And of course, I was making my own fermented beverages at home in the past. And that's different when you make it yourself yeah. from the land, from food you grew or whatever. Like like I used to make the best apple cider. Um, but thank you for not demonizing these things, you know, for helping people see the value in a lot of things that just look terrible. So. <laughs> uh yeah, I'm glad you. I'm really glad you brought that up. I've, uh, I'm, and I'm sure you've heard stories of people living into their 90s and 100s smoking every day. Like this one article I have here: a woman aged to 112 years old says her secret to long life is smoking 30 cigarettes a day. <laughs> but she, wow. but she's not doing traditional. She was saying that it was, uh, you know, tobacco, clean tobacco wrapped in tendu leaf, so not yeah. commercially uh commercial cigarettes and i mean she's you know shriveled up like a raisin but i think that's because she wasn't drinking pristine water <laughs> i was like <laughs> oh yeah you know i've had a couple examples in my life that have been stunning about cigarettes yeah. and you know i will share that right now so my my boyfriend my partner he um he actually smokes right and so i got him right away to transition to organic uh, cigarettes and i actually got him to roll cigarettes I actually grew the tobacco thinking, you know, he can use this. So um, it was really cool to see him go through a progression and find out what works best for him. And he has actually pretty amazing lungs. He doesn't seem to have any problems at all. And I'm kind of amazed by that. And another example in my life was my grandmother. My grandmother, she died at 96 and... She smoked cigarettes since she was 13 years old, and she was spunky. My grandma, by the way, she was one of the first Rockettes before it was kind of cool, and she was ashamed about it, so I didn't find out until, you know, she was dying, but she she smoked her whole life. I'm the one that would get sick. I'd go visit her. I'd have trouble. My grandma never had a spot on her lungs. Why is that? I don't know, but um, I'm certainly not 
condoning cigarettes. And we're just having this conversation, and I don't want people to think that I support cigarettes. <laughs> Smoking is not really a good thing. Well, yeah, because I, I worked, uh, I'm pretty open about my career history. And I mean, I've worked so many different jobs, Pet Smart and uh, just cannabis dispensaries. And this one dispensary I worked for, because uh, I was hitting CBD pretty hard back then before it was kind of trending, or maybe when it was starting to trend. But my coworkers, especially the managers at the cannabis dispensary I worked at, they were they were smoking on their break menthol cigarettes, like every break. Mm-hmm. And I was just like looking at the ingredients and I was like, you know, what's this flavor made of? You know, this menthol flavor, like what what chemicals are in there? I was curious. And I don't think they were addicted to the tobacco. And that's what people think. It's like people get addicted to nicotine. It's highly addictive. You know, you have to put that warning on like any product that contains nicotine. But I really think it's the chemicals, not the not the nicotine um, yes. or the tobacco yes. itself that's addictive. Because uh, I, yeah. I don't know if I've ever said it on the podcast. I think I have a few times. But I, I smoke cigars. Uh, like I had the Georgie interview, uh, the hormonal effects of cannabis, tobacco, and alcohol, which is really uh, fun. And tobacco and alcohol specifically are aromatase inhibitors, which is mm-hmm. huge because everyone, you know, if, if you have PUFA overload, then you have excess estrogen, and then uh, serotonin goes up, and you have this cascade of hormonal effects. And so just to have some AIs in there, some aromatase inhibitors, it can make a huge yeah. difference in your health systemically. Um, right, and isn't that fascinating because it's contrary to what we're told. We are told that, that alcohol is such a terrible thing, <laughs> right? Tobacco is such a terrible thing. And actually, thanks to you, I, I did continue my dive into tobacco, and I've smoked uh, two and a half cigars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I actually did roll my own cigarettes from my own tobacco that I grew for a while and experimented with it very rarely, you know, but it was very fun. And so I like thinking about it now. It was an aromatase inhibitor <laughs> and orange juice. I see you talk about that all the time. Yeah, you know, we, we don't get good oranges up here, so I kind of took a break from that, unfortunately. But I, I miss good ripe oranges. They have to be ripe to have the right flavor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, while we're still on this call, mm-hmm. I want to mention something uh, that I've used completely off the topic right now, but copper cream, mm-hmm. along with the high iron, I've had to find other ways to you know, utilize copper. And so copper cream is something that I've tried and copper serum topically. So I just wanted to throw that out there in case anyone listening is um, dealing with high iron. There's a business, Dr. Pickart's Mm -hmm. um, Skin Biology, Reverse Aging, something like that. Anyway, I, I ordered it from him and used copper cream, copper serum, and then Dr. Callen has a new copper cream. This is not a plug for their product. It, it, but it's a plug for, you know, another way to get copper and through the skin. And the, um, Lauren Pickard, his actually, he has some with retinol and copper. And so I just wanted to put that out there in case anyone is listening to this podcast about iron specifically. Don't want to forget that. I love it. I, I learned about that from Morley in our last chat. And I actually ordered some. I haven't used it consistently. Um, I just started using the tallow cream because I, tallow, because I don't use anything on my skin but mm-hmm. I wanted to start putting something on it because uh, I'm doing everything internally and nothing really externally. <laughs> and so I figure if I do yeah. both, it'd be better. Sure. But. Yeah, because I've had such skin issues, that's like my issue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have had an entire library of just about every product out there that's, that's not, not, not toxic, you know, that's mm-hmm. like the least toxic. Um, you know, you look at my shelf, I have like a hundred things. And the copper serum, you know, the, one of the symptoms that I've had, and I think that it really makes sense with the Wi-Fi and all that, that the skin itching uh, and histamine, I think the body's been doing a very good job of trying to protect me, and it just sucks. It's miserable. But when I would use the copper serum, it's instant. That copper is instantly helping the sensation change, minimally, but it does help. And so, again, that's another thing that because I'm so sensitive, I know that it's doing something and working kind of like the blue shield. I know that that works and kind of like, I know that vortex water helps me and, um, you know, yeah, but I, I noticed it instantly when I put that serum on. That's cool. It's funny. Cause I bought it to put on my goats, like especially the goats utter, or I was going to try to like oh. give co- that copper oh. serum to the goats somehow. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Interesting. 
I haven't figured that out, but my idea is like, let them transmute, you know, to the best form, you know, whatever I give them. But, uh, my old goats, I gave them the, the copper bolus capsules, you know, the, it's like, I think it's like copper oxide and it's so crazy because it's like little metal shavings in this clear capsule you can see. And I kind of almost felt yeah. bad giving to it, given I'm like, am I dosing them with heavy, <laughs> yeah, some metals, but, uh, mm -hmm. I guess they can break down. I mean, everything they eat anything. So. Yes, I mean, they would eat twigs, sticks, <laughs> pencil thick. They eat so much. Oh, my gosh. They just, they eat it all. They're, they're amazing. I think, you know, having a goat, or you kind of have to have more than one because they're herd animals, mm -hmm. but they're just such a fabulous gift to us. You know, they can turn in anything that you can't eat into milk that you can drink. Pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of the best, like, in the beginning or near the beginning, we were talking about food. Uh, security and just with where society is heading and I think um, like food shortages are probably the most likely scenario like to happen in the US and that's what happened in Russia and that's that's that seems to be how the elites will like clear humans out of an area is just starve them to death and so just to have like good food security and no animal husbandry and I've thought about it I'm like if I have a buck and a doe I could literally keep this whole street alive like yes. that's like profound i've just thought about that a few times i'm like wow i mean it's because because there's tons of water here and there's just foliage mm -hmm. everywhere i mean i guess when it yeah. snows that's a different story <laughs> have you had a buck yet yeah we have one yeah mm -hmm. you do yeah okay. okay now is he like um can he make babies right now no, he's a little ways off. He's pretty young. I think he's going to grow to be like double the size. I'm trying to remember how okay. old he is. I, I want to say like maybe three or four months. Uh, but he's really fun. He'll, uh, he'll kind of feign a charge. Like he'll get up on his two hind legs and his, uh -huh. kind of rear his head back, you know, next to me. And I don't know if he's okay. playing or challenging me, but um, he seems yeah. pretty sweet and he definitely likes well, to be pet. <laughs> it's going to be a fascinating transition when he into puberty. <laughs> yeah. when, it's one of the best things ever that I ever did was go country and raise my own children, my daughter and my son, uh, with goats that were growing and changing. We started off with two dairy goats and then got them pregnant. I was babysitting a buck, and boy, was he had a handful. I had a buck for three months, and he didn't care whether you were a human or a goat. That thing just wanted to mate. It was crazy. So... It's pretty intense having a buck, and you don't need more than one, not at all. And um, we had, our goats had kids, and it was just so funny to have these little lap goats that were adorable and cuddly and cute. And as the boys grew and they changed and just wanted to mate, and they're peeing on themselves, their face, their legs, and it was disgusting, I mean, a smell, but that's what goats do, and um, their behavior changed. And it was like, it was a great conversation topic with my kids because we unschooled. You know, I really did a lot of facilitating of their learning in many ways. But having goats was awesome because they saw these little lap goats change from cuddly and fun to hold to just all they wanted to do was mate. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> that kind of happens in humans. <laughs> That's you know, so fun. You're in for a, an experience when that goat grows up a little bit more. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And yeah, the, the, the shed's going to be a little more enclosed. So I'm sure it's you know going from an open shed to a more enclosed one. I'm thinking of doing the hypo air filters and trying to do something for the air quality and experimenting with different things in that shed. Um, I thought about getting okay. a blue shield or something in there. It'd be interesting. <laughs> See how they act. I, I've never, like we didn't really have a problem with the air in our barn. I mean, mm -hmm. our ghost got out, of course, mm -hmm. you know, we would have them out running around everywhere and then they actually had yeah a lot of land to run on mm -hmm. and a lot of brush they love brush but um we had to keep the buck separate you know yeah. well i guess we didn't have to but you know i did and i was glad when i took him home yeah yeah, yeah it'll be interesting well um i think we'll wrap it up um okay maybe maybe i'll have you on again um once you're fully healed, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this was really fun. I think there's a lot for people to, to look into and and um, consider. And you're on Instagram, right? Lady B seventy one, is it? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. me on Instagram. Yep. Awesome. Um, 
Yeah, and anything, uh, if you write an ebook or anything, I'll put it below at some point. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I just, I definitely, as I heal, you know, mm-hmm. I'll be able to you know, give more content mm-hmm. and have more structure. It's just, it is, it is a challenge, you know, up and down experience. And I'm still here. I'm still here. Going to keep on. And it's been really fun to get to share with you, to share with other people. And hopefully, you know, hopefully they'll find some value in some of the stuff that we, that I talked about with you. I know they value stuff you say all the time. You know, people really appreciate what you're doing and I do too. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Your journey is so inspiring and, um, the, the solutions are different to what you hear in the alternative community. And so um, hopefully people that are stuck and that are you know tired of spinning their wheels have at least something new to try that will most likely work. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, All right, Matt. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Beverly. Um, hang on as I close out the show. Okay. Isn't Beverly just awesome? She's really fun to talk to, and her story is just so inspiring that she just keeps going, even though she's been through so many different things. I mean, cancer is pretty intense, and now to deal with iron overload, which is probably the underlying cause of that cancer, doing the the deeper uh, work to, to reverse all that accumulation and that damage in the body. It's a, it's a long road and it takes patience and dedication. And Beverly has both and just a really uh, sweet spirit. I wasn't expecting her to cry during the interview. That's a mighty life radio first. And that could definitely be a part of healing. It's just to uh, uh, release those emotions. And I always do my best to help my friends, uh, even When people are working here on the house, uh, whether it be my carpenter or plumber or whatever it is, I I love helping people and just giving to them when I can. And there's something about giving someone a pristine water espresso shot with freshly roasted, fresh ground coffee that just really lights me up and fulfills me. And I just love giving people vitamin E uh, when I see them in person. I've even given it to uh, one of the managers at a burger joint near us and uh, just gifting raw milk, you know, made with pristine water. It's just awesome. It feels really good to, to help people. And, um, for me, it's it's especially on a physical sense because I think a lot of people have uh, emotional support and spiritual support. But I've noticed, uh, especially here in Idaho, um, people can have those things and then still break down because they're getting poisoned on the physical level from multiple different angles and they can't see where all of it's coming from. And fact of the matter is coming from everywhere. So the water, the air, soil, all toxic, not depleted, toxic. And so that really breaks someone down. And I believe ultimately, uh, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually in the long run. I definitely think they all work together. You can't just say this is the most important because they're all important to me. And physical health is often uh, very, very neglected. So that's why I have Mito Life Radio to share uh, a lot of things that are counter to what's being spoken about in the alternative health community, like a ketogenic diet and restricting a macronutrient, whether it be carbohydrate or protein. And if you're going to restrict a macronutrient, I think fat is the one to restrict. That's pretty obvious, uh, given that we can make fat from sugar. You can listen to my interviews with Adam Bergstrom about that. But carbohydrates and protein, those are are really, really important, um, especially for the liver. You need to have that glycogen so those 500 functions can happen. 
So I love speaking with Beverly. I think she has a lot of wisdom. Um, she's obviously chronologically older than I am. But we learn from each other all the time. And she's just an awesome friend. And it was just really fun to finally have her on the show and share her journey that she's still working through today. There were a few Q&A questions that we didn't get to. So I just wanted to quickly go down the list here. I think there's actually like eight or nine, but I'll do my best to not be long-winded with them. And a lot of them uh, usually have a, a similar answer because I like to simplify health. I don't think it has to be complicated. It's not about going through, you know, an herbal, you know, 1,000 page book and finding which herbs you need to take in a certain combination at a certain time and blah, blah, blah. How about just the basics, right? Are you showering in tap water? Are you drinking tap water? What's the air you're breathing? NPK food, iron overload, calcification, lipofuscin fibrosis. It's usually what I, what I go to. But the first question is, why are oxalates so aggravating to our system? And my answer is because everyone's messed up majorly especially the people that are in the alternative health community that coach clients that have thousands and thousands of followers. Those people are often the most messed up, in fact. So when I think about anti-nutrients, plant toxins, which are uh, really just focused on in the carnivore community a lot, uh, lectins, phytates, oxalates, all of these things. And I agree to a certain extent, someone should not be doing handfuls of bird food, which are called nuts and seeds. I call it bird food, which I used to do. I used to, I mean, it's not a food. These are bird food items. They're not meant for uh, humans to eat, especially in large amounts. So oxalates are so aggravating to our system when our liver isn't functioning. That's my answer. Because the liver should be, be able to handle oxalates and lectin and phytates and all of these anti-nutrients in the plants. It's just when we eat tons of them, I mean, if we're eating a salad for every meal or multiple times a day, uh, I eat a salad on average once a week. And it's usually when I go out because certain places here in Idaho have delicious salads and I just do it for the experience. And I feel like the fiber does have a beneficial effect, especially at reducing estrogen. Because people are all about the raw carrot salad, which I do here and there. But any fiber, is my understanding, will help to reduce recirculating estrogen. And so fiber is not evil, <laughs> like the carnivores say. It's just always something to demonize. It's like, let's just go back to balance. That makes sense to me. What color should we be urinating? Someone asked. Um, I believe that it should be like a straw color. And this is focused on pretty heavily in the uh, detox raw vegan community because I used to be in that for about four or five years. And so I think it's the wrong thing to focus on. Um, I think water intake varies depending on the humidity level in your home, uh, the humidity level outside, how much time you're spending in each environment, uh, the temperature, uh, how much infrared is radiating through the walls in your home. Uh, there's so many factors. Um, I could say that when I'm in the city, I at least double and possibly even triple my water intake. And that is an intuitive thing. I feel like I'm just going through more water, uh, possibly because of the non-native EMFs. And so I just naturally increase my water intake. It's also more dry uh, back in California where a lot of my friends and family are uh, versus Idaho where it's a lot more humid. Uh, I thrive in more, a more humid uh, environment. And to me, that makes more sense <laughs> than living in a desert. I would say the quality of water matters more than watching your pee and seeing the color of it. Uh, make sure it's acid-free, contaminant-free, and bicarbonate-rich water. And so a lot of filters have one or the other. 
Uh, I only know of one filter that has all of it going on. And that's the pristine hydro filter that I have on my website. Someone asked what could cause eye floaters. It's my understanding that a lot of eye issues are caused by uh, excess serotonin and omega-3 breakdown products combining in the eye and creating uh, eye floaters and various other uh, inflammatory conditions in the eye. And so all the things that I personally used to take coming from that different mindset, thinking that 5-HTP supplements were good and they were good for the brain, which they're not. Uh, serotonin is not the happy hormone. It's a stress hormone. I think we went into that in my uh, women's episodes where we're talking about uh, birth control. I had two or three episodes on that recently. So you can go back and listen to those. We talked quite a lot about hormones. But if someone's on a 5-hydroxytryptophan, a.k.a. a 5-HTP supplement, that converts to serotonin, which most people have too much of already. So you don't want to take the precursor. And they're on their algae oil or fish oil, cod liver oil. And serotonin plus omega-3s plus ultraviolet light, that's not a good combo. Or blue light, uh, blue wavelength light from iPads, iPhones, you know, your Mac, just those blue lit screens, that combination will create tons of eye issues. And that's not to mention if you're taking a lot of carotenoids, like beta carotene. And you have liver problems, so you can't convert it. Your thyroid's suppressed. You can't convert the beta carotene into retinol. It accumulates. That can cause some eye issues. Also, astaxanthin, which I used to supplement in large doses. That, to me, is toxic. I would not supplement astaxanthin. And if you did take it, then just be aware that you can get excess carotenoids stored in your body and that can suppress thyroid function and the function of all tissues. So just some things to think about. Uh, the best things for the eyes are vitamin E, uh, vitamin E therapy, which is a suppressed therapy that used to be used quite extensively for uh, various conditions, um, eye issues especially. And uh, Herbert Bailey has some good books on that. And I'm talking high dose 3000 I use plus was used for even years. But with the fastable vitamins, it's really about balance. So A, D, E, and K. If you're on an animal based diet, animal based nutrition, you're eating uh, raw dairy, pastured eggs, pastured ruminant animals, like grass fed beef, then you're getting a lot of fat soluble vitamins, but the ones that can be bumped up are vitamin E and K2, especially in the metaquinone 7 form, which is only found in aged cheese and fermented soy. So that's my purely K product, and a lot of people are seeing benefit from that one. So I'd say take your E and K, uh, lower the PUFAs in the diet, um, and all the other stuff will just help. I mean, the systemic enzymes, I have a dissolve it all supplement that eats fibrin or scar tissue all throughout the body. And yes, we do get scar tissue in the eyes because we get retinal damage. And so I just did a post uh, recently on the eyes and lipofuscin and age related macular degeneration, which is a loaded. Uh, diagnosis because it's not age related. It's like it should be called lipofuscin related macular degeneration because that's what degrades the eyes. It's really lipofuscin. And remember that lipofuscin is iron, omega 3s, and estrogen. And there could be some other metals in there, aluminum, and some other proteins and molecules, but it's largely those. And serotonin makes it worse. And all that kind of goes together. What supplements are needed for children to recover from PUFA toxicity? I would say largely vitamin E. Remember that PUFAs increase vitamin E requirements by six times. Six times. 
And it could take years, often three to four years, to recover from a high PUFA diet because you're literally switching out the fat that is stored in the adipose tissue from more unsaturated to more saturated. And so vitamin E can be excellent for that. Also just consuming sugar or carbohydrate, which you can make oleic acid from. Um, especially if you're PUFA deficient, you can make uh, omega-9 meat acid. So it's really a combination, I would say, of vitamin E uh, and the dosage. You know, I personally used four a day. Uh, for a year, and then I did short bouts of eight to 12 a day. It really depends on what you're going for. Uh, if you're about to go to a high UV environment, say going on vacation where you're going to get a lot more sunlight, you can pre dose on vitamin E and load your tissues with vitamin E before you go to protect you from UV induced photo damage. So, ultraviolet light harms you because it's reacting with the PUFA and the skin. And that to me is what contributes to skin cancer and melanomas and things like that. Lipofuscin especially. So vitamin E, uh, lowering the PUFAs in the diet, um, you can increase the saturated fats, uh, say especially if someone uh, could gain weight, like a, a child or someone that's just a hard gainer. They don't really have to count their saturated fats. That's like myself. But if someone were trying to lose weight while lowering PUFA toxicity, I would say go lower fat and focus on the animal protein and the carbohydrates. Someone says constipation, stuck stool on a meat-based diet. I'm eating too little veg and fiber. What is the issue? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of issues with the meat-based diet uh, the calcium to phosphate ratio, uh, way too much phosphate, phosphorus, not enough calcium because dairy is often restricted. And I would say uh, up, the, up the fiber, experiment with that. Even just one raw carrot a day, uh, see if that helps because um, that can also help with endotoxin and uh, reduce recirculating estrogen and lower, lowering serotonin. So just that one raw carrot um, could be helpful and you can even soak it if you're extremely compromised and you don't want to have a lot of carotenoids. You can soak it in water in the fridge and, you know, no specific protocol for that. Just soak it till the orange goes out overnight or whatever. And you can try that. Uh, I would say just go back on a more balanced, you know, eating program where you include carbohydrates with it. Uh, try white rice, try white potatoes, try uh, wild rice like I have on my website. Um, you could try honey and maple syrup. And I believe that will reduce stress and relax the intestines so that you can have a proper bowel movement. Is avocado oil a PUFA? So I get questions like this a lot. Things are always a combination. So even coconut oil has PUFAs in it. It's just less than 10%. And so it's still good. So a ton of saturated fat. Uh, same with olive oil. Olive oil has a lot of monounsaturated fat. I believe that's most of the fat content, more than half. Even though there's some PUFA in olive oil, it's still beneficial because it's mostly MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acids, which are uh, very beneficial. I wouldn't say guzzle it, but if you want to have it on your salad, it's not a problem. Avocado oil, although it has saturated fat, it does have more polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs than olive oil. But if you enjoy it, you like putting it on your salad or whatever you eat, I would say it's not an issue. I wouldn't cook with it, um, especially high heat. Even though it's going in a tropical body, you just don't want to... Uh, cook with things with a lot of PUFA. For cooking, I would stick with ghee, coconut oil, tallow, and lard. Just saturated fats, animal fats, with the exception of coconut oil, are generally safe to cook with. 
Last question, does vitamin E travel through breast milk? If not, how much can I give to my two-year-old? Uh, it definitely does travel through breast milk. Now that's one of the benefits of raw milk. I especially love goat's milk, but all milk has vitamin E in it. Um, I would definitely give it directly to the two-year-old if it was my child. And you could break open the capsule. Just hit it with a steak knife and just squeeze it into the bowl of whatever they're eating or just directly in their mouth and just squeeze it in, have them wash it down with a liquid. Um, that would work. And vitamin E is especially good for children. Um, I have a book specifically on vitamin E for children's health, and it's incredible what it could do. So that's it for today's show. I uh, hope you enjoyed my conversation with Beverly. That was a lot of fun. And check her out on Instagram, uh, Lady B, B E E 71. I'll put the link below. If you want to check out what she's doing, she makes the best sourdough bread I've ever had. And she has, I believe, a video on how to make that really, really good. <laughs> Um, you can check out my website, matt-blackburn.com. Um, you can see the blue shield that she mentioned that really helped her with her non-native EMF exposure. And I just put uh, hydrogen on there. Um, I just took a break from biohacking just because I saw it going a really crazy direction. But I think certain tools uh, like hydrogen gas could have uh, benefits. So I threw those tablets on there. Uh, if you search molecular hydrogen or just scroll down to the M, you'll see it. Um, even a molecular hydrogen gas inhaler. Um, if I had a really intense disease uh, like cancer, or let's even say I was going through chemo, I would use that at the same time. Uh, definitely the 7% strongest one um, in combination with lowering PUFAs, vitamin E, red light therapy, magnesium bicarbonate, shilajit, all the good stuff, systemic enzyme therapy. Um, I'm actually going to do a whole show <clears throat> inspired by my friend Justin Stellman of Extreme Health Radio on what I would do if I had cancer because I think uh, people could benefit from that. Uh, there's a lot of tools that I would use and a lot of things I would avoid like the plague, like omega-3 supplements, which actually make cancer worse. So you can check out my products on mitolife.co. Uh, Purely K should be coming it back in stock any day now. Um, if you've been waiting for your order from Mitolife, thank you for your patience. This whole coronavirus stupidness, madness, whatever you want to call it, has delayed shipments just all around. And so everything's just slower and just thanks for being patient. A lot of people are waiting for my K27 supplement to come back in stock. And you could also sign up on the page. If you go to Purely K, just type in your email and you'll get notified uh, right when it comes back in stock. And so I would say stock up on that and I'll do better with upping the inventory to keep up with demand because people are I'm just overwhelmed with how many people loved that supplements 400 micrograms per serving of metaquinone 7 and again I've said it before but the combination of D3 with K2 is not smart because that will increase calcification and antagonize other vitamins like vitamin A which allows copper be converted to ceruloplasmin and just causes this downstream negative effect. And also I want to address liposomal supplements like the sprays because these marketers say that it's more absorbable while they jack up the price and just make up all of this micelle, liposomal, mycelized, all of these things. It's all marketing and some people would argue that's all the supplement industry is. But I think a lot of it's education because you can go to CVS Pharmacy and buy a soy-based vitamin E supplement and it's going to be too low dose and you're going to be ingesting a genetically modified soybean oil and you don't have any education with that. 
and then you go to MitoLife website and you have pure medium chain triglyceride oil base MCT oil, which helps to inhibit lipid peroxidation, which you'll never see that on a vitamin E bottle besides MitoLife, and a non-GMO sunflower derived vitamin E in that MCT oil. And then you have a whole pretty much dissertation on that product page about why I'm obsessed with vitamin E and why I think you should take it. And so all that education goes into it and all of the research that I've done, I don't see a lot of people connecting the dots with lipid peroxidation and vitamin E. It's referenced in a lot of books that I read about lipofuscin, yellow fat disease material that vitamin E helps. But why aren't people taking it? Why are they taking omega-3 supplements? It's because all of these biohacker, quote unquote, longevity brain experts are recommending PUFAs for brain health, along with a keto diet. And that's the worst combination I could ever think of, because that will cause massive degeneration and accelerated aging. So back to liposomals, it's marketing. They say they're better absorbed. It's more effective. You're getting more out of it, blah, 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 blah. That's all BS. And that is not true. If you take pills, a gel cap, a veggie cap, and there's the substance in the pill, you're going to absorb it. I've had amazing benefits from desiccated beef liver. I have that on my website, Ancestral Supplements. A lot of people have benefited from just supplementing beef liver. I also love their thyroid extract, their thyroid glandular. Those are the main two I focus on. Uh, the testicle one, the male formula is fun for men. If you feel tired, uh, that's a great regenerative one. But mainly the thyroid and the liver. And they work. It's just powder in a capsule, desiccated or, uh, organs or glands in a capsule. And so there's this weird mentality, like it has to be in this like encapsulated nano form for it to get into the cell. And that's BS. It's not true. I think that the stomach is intelligent, the body's intelligent, and you should let it choose what goes in. We shouldn't be forcing things in with IVs and liposomal nano formulas. That's insane. You're trying to sidestep God's design and you're shoving things in a system that might not need it. If you take a capsule, say a MitoLife supplement, your body's able to choose what it needs and it'll excrete what it doesn't. It's an intelligent design. So don't fall for the hype. Don't get duped with crazy prices on these supplements. I try my best to keep the MitoLife products affordable where it's still sustainable for me to continue the business. So check out mitolife.co. Um, I'm working on more products for that and send me any suggestions. I'm thinking about a lipofuscin a detox supplement at some point. So that'll be a lot of fun. And just thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot that you listen to the show and share this with your friends and leave an iTunes review and keep learning. When you're in your car, don't just listen to music, listen to some podcasts for half the time or switch it up, go back and forth. But podcasts are awesome to listen to on drives. I believe that part of the plan is wasting people's time with driving long distances in a car. And so to twist that around into a positive you can learn on the go. And that way you're not wasting your time being stuck in traffic anymore. or going 10 miles an hour on the freeway. You're actually learning. So thanks so much. And I'll see you on next Friday's show. Today's quote is by Wilfred E. Shute, MD, from the book Your Child and Vitamin E. Another common complication of the preemie is anemia, a loss of hemoglobin the oxygen-carrying substance of the blood. Anemia, of course, increases the above-mentioned complications of prematurity. This anemia responds to vitamin E as long as the child is not given iron to correct the anemia or 
is not on the unfortunately now popular infant formula with the high content of polyunsaturated fat. Dr. Lois Johnson of the University of Pennsylvania, who has 269 premature babies in her study group, says that all premature should have vitamin E therapy. There is still more evidence that vitamin E is essential or at least useful for all infants, both full term and premature. Many newborn infants develop the same type of anemia as the premature infants after two weeks of a cow's milk formula. Doctors Lowe, Frank, and Hitzig have reported that the anemia and all signs and symptoms of it disappear after a few days on vitamin E. The British Medical Journal for October 4, 1975 described the case of a 16-month-old boy who had developed chronic jaundice, liver trouble, and gallbladder involvement. Because vitamin E deficiency is often diagnosed by abnormality of the red blood cells, and he showed this abnormality, he was given vitamin E. This therapy led to complete recovery. 